Great. Um, what I'm talking about is revision. And the subtitle is, or no one runs the play perfectly the first time. And the reason I use this subtitle is that um, having been a, an English teacher for a long time, I found that students were you know, reluctant to um, revise their writing because they felt that um, they shouldn't have to. You know, they, they did it. Um, Simon has accomplished, had to be one page, and certainly it is one page. Why do I have to revise it? And the analogy I use is, look, if you're an athlete, you know, and you show up for practice and the, place, and the coach says, okay, we're gonna do something new. And he chalks it out, you know, and he does everything. You run out to the field. Does the team run it perfectly the first time? Or when you sit down at a piano and you're a competent pianist and you open up the music, do you just rip off that piece and think, okay, Beethoven's fifth, nailed that. You know, Rachmaninoff, no problem. Um, it's the same with writing. People become better writers and really proficient writers through practice. I'll just tell a little bit, little anecdote before we get into the uh, actual slideshow. Uh, when I was a boy, my father was a journalist. And um, he took an active interest in my writing because while he uh, wasn't you know, into sports very much or things like that, one thing he was an authority on was writing. So when I got to be about a sophomore in high school and I had papers to do, he would say, come on over here, sit down next to me. Let's see the paper you're working on. And he would be an editor to my paper, you know, with my paper. Here I am writing a paper on a Cry the Beloved Country or, or the Cold War for my Asian Civilization class. And he would get out a pen and he would start marking it up. And the first time he did it, I just gripped my teeth. So, Dad, I'm going to have to do it all over again. And he would say, yeah, but look, right here you sound so strident, it's really off-putting. It's almost as if you're wagging your finger at me and telling me that I have no right to my opinion. And then further down here, you're going along full speed, and we get to the conclusion, and you just sort of drop it. Suddenly, it ends. And I said, well, I don't have anything else to say. And he would, you know, compel me to look at how to be more effective. And I couldn't argue with the result because while I wasn't a, a real scholar in, in school and math and science, after a while, more and more often, my papers started going up on the bulletin board or the teacher would make an overhead at, out of my paper and say, see what he's been doing here? And I thought, well, what do you know? The old man does know something. It's sort of like what Mark Twain said. You know, when I was, Mark Twain said, when I was 17, uh, my father was so stupid, I could hardly stand and have the old man around. And when I was 25, I couldn't believe how much he'd learned in eight years. And so I found out that, you know, my father, who'd been a journalist for most of his life, really did know how to improve a paper through doing it again. So let's talk a little bit about this. What's it mean to revise? Revision means to see it again, to look at something from a fresh, critical perspective. Um, it's an ongoing process of rethinking the paper, as opposed to just you know, getting it done, writing it in pen, running it off, whatever, from the computer. It's thinking critically about what you've written. It's reconsidering your arguments. It's looking to see if you've got adequate evidence to back up what you said. It might mean refining your purpose. Um, I don't know whether you had this experience, but you know, my fits of terror in college included this. Uh, going to a final exam, being given a blue book and being told to write a response in it to a particular question, and then realizing I'm half an hour into the writing that I had drifted way away from what I said I was going to talk about and was digressing beautifully about something else. So sometimes you have to refine your purpose in that you are going down a path and you discover new things, and lo, this paper isn't what I said it was gonna be about, but it's way more interesting this way. Reorganizing the way you're presenting your information, and sometimes revising stale prose. I was reading a book the other day um, on um, a baseball player, and I got about 50 pages into it, and I said to my wife, I just can't go on. And she said, why? I said, because he reaches for the easiest cliches in that. I mean, it, it, whatever comes to hand, you know, volcanic anger, a colossal swat of the bat, 
uh, the roaring crowd. Uh, you know, it was it was there it was there was no risk taking. There was no adventurous writing. There was no imaginative prose. It was just whatever came to hand. And I saw I had to put the book down. Now let's talk about though why revision is important. Writing is really a process of discovery. Revision is a chance to look critically to see what you've written and to see whether it's really worth saying, um, whether it is what you wanted to say, and whether a reader will understand what you're saying. I can't emphasize too much this, this idea, this uh, important concept of discovery. Um, I really remember when I was um, writing my, my first biography on Harper Lee, the author of To Kill a Mockingbird, I was going to lunch with a friend, and he was really asking me about the book and what I was going to write about, and I was really well into it. I had done a lot of the research by that time, and I had written probably about half of it. And he was trying to get very, he wanted me to be very specific about the book and where it was going. And finally, I just turned to him and I said, I don't know, I'll get, when I get there, all right? When, you know, I, I'm sort of finding my way. In the beginning of Dante's Inferno, he says, when I reached middle age, I came to a dark wood and I lost my way. And the whole rest of the book is a process of, of discovery. And anything creative involves a lot of risk. Anything that's the least bit uh, imaginative, if it's going to be of any quality at all, requires you to go out on a limb and, and to take a risk. Um, no one wants to read things that have already been said. Nobody's particularly interested in things that are unclear or that reinforce what you already know. How many articles do you see in the paper or online that you scan quickly and you think subconsciously, not in words so much, but subconsciously, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And you keep going, and you keep going, and you're looking for that hook, you're looking for the news. Uh, so when you're writing, you're on a journey. Somebody might say, students often say, well, yeah, but I thought revision was just fixing the commas and the spelling. You know, I go back and I make sure that I didn't spell uh, there or receive the wrong way or I don't have a comma splice or a run-on sentence. Nope, that is really proofreading. It's an important step be before turning your paper in, but if your ideas are predictable, your thesis is weak, your organization's all over the place, then proofreading will just be putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. In other words, everything spelled right, punctuated properly, but the real heart of it, the meat of it, is uninteresting or, uh, or uh, doesn't engage the reader or is not logical. When you finish revising, last step is to proofread. Right? Um, you know, many writers, um, the Kurt Vonnegut said this one time, he said, you know, people sometimes put down my writing as very, very simplistic. Um, but he said, you don't understand the amount of care that goes in to the <coughs> writing. He said, the first step is I write down everything I know. He said, I just fly, you know, and I sort of let my subconscious kick in. And then I go back and I look at it. And of course, a lot of it's rambling and a lot of it is digressive. But then I go back in and I pull out the good stuff and the dross falls by the side. And he said, and it's that reorganization process that eventually ends up, eventually creates the simple prose that I get put down for. He said, you know, the, behind that, the backstory is a lot of writing that landed on the floor. Hemingway in fiction said that when you're writing a novel, the reader only sees, it's like, it's like an iceberg. When you're writing a novel, the reader sees the top of the iceberg and below the waterline is two thirds of it. And that's all that you know and all that you wrote in your first couple of drafts and all of the, maybe the backstory that you created to realize, I don't need to tell all that, I'll show that instead. So revising is a lot of pruning and reorganizing and rewriting. Um, proofreading is just making sure that you got the right amount of air in the tires and you got enough oil in your engine to go. But some you know, young people say in particular, but if I just reword things, you know, like look for better words and make sure I haven't used the same word over and over again, that's revision, right? Well, that's a part of revision. 
revision is moving the big stuff around. Word choice and polishing your prose is really editing. An editor will go through a piece of prose and do, first of all, what's called line editing, which is they go through and they tighten up the prose and they you know, see when you've been redundant. And then they get into the deep stuff, which is suggestions for revision. So authors will get back a manuscript that has been line edited for word choices, and arrange, and, but then you'll get back the deep stuff with the arrows, and this part can go, and that sort of thing, and that's revision. But I don't want to rewrite my whole paper. Well, revision doesn't necessarily mean rewriting the whole paper. Sometimes it means tuning up the thesis to make sure that the thesis will deliver everything that comes after that. You know, making sure that the thesis is an umbrella on which everything follows. The thesis might be too narrow. The thesis might not be provocative enough to carry the whole paper. So the thesis is, you know, sort of the overture, the theme to uh, the rest of the paper, and it's got to be all-encompassing and strong enough to bear the weight of all the paragraphs that come after that. You may need to come up with stronger arguments to defend your position. You know, when I, when I taught writing, and still when I teach writing, people oftentimes believe that in America, you know, that where we um, emphasize individualism, people believe that their opinion is evidence enough. Um, or maybe they were there and they were a witness or something like that. Uh, personal opinion is not evidence, no matter how sterling a person you are, no matter how good your character, no matter how reliable and honest a person you are, it's just your opinion. So uh, warning flags you know, that go up in a paper or a composition are, I think, in my opinion, it seems to me, Occasionally that's okay, but you know, read stuff in the New York Times, for example, when somebody turns in an op-ed piece. I defy you to go through an op-ed piece or an editorial and find, of course they speak in the, in the we prose, but I defy you to find many instances of I think. Uh, they just, you know, they put forth their argument and they back it up with, their, with evidence. Sometimes shifting around the order of paragraphs makes the argument flow better. Uh, everything comes down to, you know, emphasis. Everything comes down to, well, like Stephen King said, he said, you know, I don't know whether I'm really the best novelist around, but I'll tell you this, I can make you turn the page. And it's true. Sometimes you'll come to slow spots in a King novel, but you just know there's something around the bend because he keeps up the, the, the flow and the suspense by making sure one thing follows another, and you've got to turn the page to see what happens next. So it's that emphasis, and everything has to be subordinated to that. If it doesn't flow, paragraphs are out of order. It's like watching a runner stumble. It's like listening to a car with valve rattle. It's like listening to a car that's hitting on five pistons instead of six. You want emphasis and you want momentum. Sadly, sometimes revision does mean trashing your first draft. You, I don't know, you got off on the wrong foot and you went that way and it's just like getting lost. You know, you come to a fork in the road and you took the wrong one. And you thought you were making progress and then you realize you shouldn't have gone that way. It's unproductive or it's a dead end. But I work so hard on what I write. I, don't, I can't afford to throw any of it away. And this is, you know, how do we start? This is um, something that anybody can appreciate who has practiced the craft of writing. It's really, really wrenching at times to realize that you got it just the way you wanted it, and you added some more, and you added some more, and now suddenly the part that you spent so much time on. Doesn't, it doesn't fit, or is off the point, or that beautiful paragraph, you know, is, just doesn't stand up anymore. Um, Dorothy Parker, the, you know, the columnist, satirist, uh, uh, play reviewer, recommended to all writers, kill your darlings. You have to be merciless. 
you have to take that beautiful paragraph and say, you know, sorry, darling, but uh, sorry, honey, but you got to go. And you kick that paragraph out of your life. Um, if you want to be a polished writer, then you can't afford not to throw stuff away. As writers, we often produce a lot of material that needs to get tossed. I mean, not being willing to throw away parts is like doing a woodshop project in your garage and thinking you have to use all the scraps. You know, but that's a big piece of wood. You know, I probably, what if I nailed it onto the cabinet in the back for support? All right, it's still a big piece of oddly shaped wood nailed to the back. It doesn't need to be there. I do this, and sometimes it pays off. Um, when I pull out things from my writing that I think is really good, I have a, a file called Outtakes. It's a folder on my desktop, and I drop all kinds of things in there, thinking, you know, maybe at some future time, that paragraph will be exactly the right shape board to go in. And that's my scrap pile. I don't throw away scraps. And at home, I keep all my screws and I keep all my fast, you know, all my latches and everything, because you never know. The reason the cabinet door is loose is it because it needs a little Phillips screw, and I just happen to have one. So I save everything in my outtake file. And um, I'll tell you, sometimes it's brutal pulling things out. Case in point, when I was writing the Harper Lee book, Harper Lee's grandfather was in the 15th Alabama Regiment. He fought at 22 battles, including the historic fight at Little Round Top at Gettysburg, where the 15th Alabama fought in 90 degree heat all day long against Chamberlain's 20th Maine. It was a clash of the titans. These brave men were in the forest all day long with the Confederates charging the Union line and the Union line holding them back because they were the end of the Union line at Gettysburg. And if the Confederates got around them, they would turn the flank and get behind the rest of the line. The Chamberlain told them they can't get through us. And Chamberlain actually ran out of ammunition. And when they thought about, well, what do we do now? Chamberlain yelled, fix bayonets. I mean, it was a wonderful moment in, in American military history. So anyway, I could pinpoint Harper Lee's father in that fight because I ran across his commander's published journal. And boy, I had them there, man. I, you know, fainting from the heat and taking aim at each other. 9,000 words. I read it to my wife. I got done. I said, well, what do you think? She said, it's great, but it's not about Harper Lee. It's about Gettysburg. I said, yeah, but Harper Lee's grandfather was there. Right. But she said, in terms of proportion, 9,000 words in a 12,000-word chapter about one day at Gettysburg is just people are going to say, what happened to my author? You know, this is 1863, July. And I dropped out 9,000 words. Someday you will open up a magazine, and you will see Harper Lee's grandfather fighting once again by Charles J. Shields, because I have it in my outtake folder. OK, two tips before you begin revising. First of all, work from hard copy. It's easier on the eyes. Um, also, problems that seem invisible on the screen somehow tend to show up better on paper. I don't know why. It's just. Um, Maybe because computer screens are, are pretty, and you can you know, put it in your dock for a moment and go see if your friend's on Facebook and then pull it out of your dock again. Whereas if it's on paper, it's right there. Secondly, another good tip, if you want to spot problems that are getting past your eyes and your mind, read the paper aloud. Read the paper aloud. Virginia Woolf said, good writing reads like good conversation. And it's true. Really good writing sounds like people speaking. I heard Hemingway uh, read uh, a short story one time. The only time I ever heard him read, it was uh, online with an old Cadman recording. And he was reading a short story. Now, I grew up in Chicago. And Hemingway grew up in Oak Park. And you know, as Hemingway read this short story, he just sounded like a Chicagoan 
telling a story. I mean, the, the mighty Hemingway, the great Hemingway, reading his prose aloud, and it was one of his best, sounded like a Midwestern guy telling a story. If you read something aloud that you've written, you'll hear when it gets boring, because you'll be bored. You'll hear when it rambles, because it will suddenly become apparent. And I'll tell you a little technique about sentence length. If you have to take a breath when you're reading a sentence aloud, it's too long. Sentences, by their nature, the way they mimic human speech, tend to be able to be said aloud in a single breath. If you have too many dependent clauses hanging on there, like a customized hot rod, you know, with curb feelers and a lot of chrome and everything, you'll notice it because it's a long sentence and you have to draw a breath to continue it. So work from a hard copy and read it aloud. The process. Well, what steps should I use when I begin to revise? All right, there are several things to do. But don't try to do them all at one, or all at one time. Instead, focus on one, on one or two main areas during each revision session. And once again, we're a novice writer, we're protesting, so you may have to come back and revise it a couple of times. You'd be surprised. In the long run, coming back two or three times actually makes the work better, makes the work lighter. You would think that just drawing up your chair to the desk and sitting there and you know staying there until it's done by heaven, you know, if it takes a two hours, if it takes the rest of the afternoon, I'm doing this. Actually, if you came back, for about a half hour or so, two, three times, you'll see problems, and it will go faster. It is possible to get too close to a work and no longer be able to see what's good or bad because you've practically memorized it. You know, you've really grooved yourself, you've grooved your mind to this piece of writing, and you can no longer see where it's good or bad. Step one, wait a while after you've finished it, I call it letting it percolate or letting it cook. You put something away for a couple of days, and then you come back to it, and sometimes, gosh, it's really good. <laughs> or you come back and you see, I'm mixed up. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what I meant by this. Horace, the Roman poet Horace, said you should wait nine years before you revise anything. Well, not the way we live. I mean, not with online publishing and things like that, not with the pressures that are put on, on people to produce. You don't have nine years, but he was a poet. Um, wait a little bit, even if it's overnight, but let it cook. Um, some authors, you know, will begin a book, for example, uh, particularly a big book of fiction, and it, they find that it dies on them sometimes. They get way into it, and then it just loses steam, they don't know what happens next. They don't even know what the characters should be doing. And that magic moment of when the characters seem to take over doesn't come. And so, sadly, after six months, eight months, sometimes a couple of years, they realize the book died under my hands, right here on the table. Sometimes if they put it away and they come back later and they start to read, they're no longer the author, they're just a reader, and they know what they want to happen next, or they, or they like a particular character more than others, or they take a chapter and go, that thing should have been in there in the first place, out. And they're long, no longer so invested in it. They come back as a reader and they read it. Neil Gaiman, the fantasist, just published a book, something about the boneyard or cemetery or something like that. It came out a couple of years ago, and somebody asked him, um, so how long did you spend on that? On that? He said, actually, I started it in the early 90s. He said, uh, and then it just didn't, something happened, and I thought, well, still boring, and I put it away. And I took it out, and I thought, I wonder, I wonder whatever happened to that good old story. And he read it, and he saw it. So letting it, perk, letting it cook for a little bit sometimes works. Think big, don't tinker. You know, you're gonna go in there, and you're gonna move things around, and you're gonna do what it takes, you're not, you know, you're getting into the ring with your paper now, all right? And no, no hitting below the belt, on the other hand, no prisoners. You're gonna win this fight. So we're not putting in commas now. We're not correcting spelling. We're not, uh, you know, using bigger words or anything, going to the thesaurus. We're looking for clarity and order. 
If it isn't clear, your writer's going to give up. If it's disordered, your writer's going to get discouraged. So two things, clarity and order. You're going in there looking for the, for the big ones. Step three, you're looking for the big things, and now so you concentrate on the <coughs> focus. Is this answering what the assignments was at, what you were asked to do? You were assigned to look at, mm, you know, um, the embargo of slave ships by the British Navy uh, on the west coast of Africa. Was it politically motivated or was it motivated by humanitarianism? Well, as you read your paper, you realize you talk too much about capturing slaves and putting them on board in the middle passage. Great, great, that's all about slavery, but it, it's not about, you know, why did the Brits finally stop it? Was it humanitarian or was it just political? Is the topic too big or too narrow? Uh, students will go in sometimes and suggest a paper topic to a professor because it sounds captivating and it sounds, you know, worthy of college material. Uh, it's just too big. You know, it, it's a book. Uh, I remember uh, hearing a student one time where they wanted to talk about Shakespeare's, this was for a seven-page paper, Shakespeare's use of angels. Good luck. That could be a dissertation. You know, if you were in Renaissance studies, Shakespeare's use of angels. Well, it sure sounded, you know, yeah, that's a great thing, but you're not going to get that into a seven-page paper. And do you stay on track throughout the entire paper? So as you're looking for the big issues, the first thing is to make sure that this is indeed the paper that was asked for. You're able to cover the topic, and you stay right on track to the very end. Just like boarding a train that promises to be in Cincinnati 15 hours from now, you better be in Cincinnati 15 hours from now and not Tallahassee. Step four, think honestly about what you promised. In your, th your thesis is what the whole thing is hinged on, you know? Um, does your thesis really carry the whole paper because it, it runs like a backbone through the whole thing? You're constantly addressing some aspect of the thesis or proving some aspect of the thesis. Do you still agree with it? It's not unknown for people to talk themselves out of the thesis. As they begin to really think and write, they realize, I don't know if that's really true anymore. Pro probably one of the strangest moments in uh, American literary history was when um, the author of Ben-Hur had a moment of revelation. Any of you know this story? Um, I think his name was Lou. I forgot what his last name was. He was a former Union cavalryman, and then later he was governor of Indiana, I believe. In any event, he was an atheist. And he was writing Ben-Hur. And Ben-Hur was meant to be a wonderful story about Rome. And he was going to make the Christians interfering, picayune, pettifoggers, you know. And so he's writing Ben-Hur. And suddenly he realized the book was not about Rome. The book was about the struggle of the early Christians. And the whole book took a totally different focus. It was meant to be dismissive of the Christians as weak sisters and interfering with a great empire. And halfway through the book, he realized it's not about Rome. It's about the struggle of brave individuals who had convictions. And the story goes, if there was, it was not just a literary change of mind, it was a religious conversion, and the author fell on his knees next to his desk and became not an atheist, but instead a believer. So you'd be surprised. Sometimes on this voyage of discovery, you find yourself in a totally new place, just like poor old Columbus, who arrived in the Caribbean and thought he was either very near China or this was the gateway to heaven. It was so paradisical, so beautiful, that this either had to be the outlying region of China, and these people just had to tell me where to go, or it had to be the gateway to paradise. He persuaded himself of that through the next three voyages. Are you making a provocative point? You know, your thesis should be a little bit edgy. Your thesis should be a little bit provocative. Um, Christopher Hitchens was a great one for trotting out something that seemed almost outrageous and then walking you through it and 
making you realize, hmm, you know, I don't agree with them 100%, but well, that, that's pretty thought-provoking. Hitchens' essays are often a masterpiece of starting out way out there, and then by the time he got to the end thinking, well, I don't agree with him, but he sure is reasonable. That was very logical. Does your thesis generalize instead of taking a, a real position? I mean, is your thesis so broad and so floppy and so unbaked like go that you're not really taking a position, you're stating almost a truism, something that most intelligent people know. People don't read things, you know, to um, go somewhere where they've already been. If people take the trouble to sit down and read or purchase a book or read an article, they want to go somewhere and they want you to take them with you. All right? Balance is kind of a tricky thing, um, but you know it if you read it aloud, because balance is a matter of spending just enough time so that you adequately address something and then you move on. Not too much time on one thing in particular. Uh, think of my Gettysburg thing. You know, the chapter was supposed to be about the chapter was ostensibly, if you opened up that chapter, what I meant it to be was, it was gonna be an overview of her ancestors. Harper Lee, the Southerner, okay? And I talked in a couple of paragraphs about the migrating from the Virginia Tidewater area down through the Panhandle of Florida and arriving in Alabama. And that's when I got lost in the Civil War. You know, about, I'd say about, oh, maybe 1,500 words in. I had gotten them out of Virginia in, uh, this, in the 1600s and got them all the way to Alabama. And then I was held for leather for Gettysburg for the next 9,000 words. And the whole thing was lopsided. You know, it was way too heavy on Gettysburg. So it, there's got to be a sense of proportion. If it's a major point, it deserves emphasis. If it's a minor point, make it, back it up, then move off. All right? Checks. You need to check that you kept your promise to the reader. You said you were going to talk about your thesis. Maybe your thesis was indeed a bit provocative. You should deliver. There's a promise made to a reader. Um, book covers, you know, of, of fictional works are that promise made visual. Um, you go into a Barnes and Noble and you see a, a book cover with a romantic scene and a man and a woman and they're dressed in 18th century dress and you think, oh yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, I, I love that. Prince Regent stuff. Take me back to Jane Austen. And then if you open the book, and it seems to be a watered down Jane Austen or er Ersatz, uh, Charlotte Bronte, you're disappointed. You want the paper to follow through on what was promised at the beginning. And you want things supported. You want your thesis to be supported with points and not opinion. Check the organization. Does your paper follow a pattern that makes sense? Do transitions move your readers smoothly from one point to the next? I worship at the altar of transitions. I just, when I get into a jam and I'm worried that I'm not being clear, I will fall back on first, second, third. Furthermore, another point, in addition, uh, as was said above, you'd be surprised as guideposts at the intersection of paragraphs. A little word like nevertheless or Oppositely, on the other hand, in any case, transitions are so good for telling your reader, now we're going here, or having been there, we're going here, okay? In a nutshell, the overview, in sum, all right? Would your paper work better if you move some things around? And you know, this is really the wonderful thing about, about uh, word processing on computers. I know that when Computers first came about, and I was I was you know teaching English at that time. People were very skeptical about what was it going to mean if you know on the screen you couldn't see all the things that you had crossed out or whatever. If you use track changes, you can. But the really wonderful thing about computers is you can highlight a paragraph and say, "Let's try it there," and then read it and say, "No, let's let's try it there," and it works. And oh, I, I, I pity the writers of years ago who, when they would get to revision in their, in their, when they were typing on typewriters, they would get to the revision stage and have to retype, you know, whole chapters, whole drafts, just to see if it worked. Just to see if it worked. 
you know, Han Burley with the Kill Mockingbird became so discouraged at one point. She'd been working on the book for eight years, and she realized she hated it. That she had come to hate this novel. What started out as a real lark ended up being a millstone. So in about the eighth year of writing the book, one night she was sitting in her apartment, and she was revising once again, you know, the old-fashioned way, type, 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 tear it out, type, type, type. And she started to cry. And she thought, I can't go on. I just can't go on revising this book. And she took a piece of paper out of the typewriter and she put it on the manuscript that she had finished, that she was happy with. And she walked over to the window and she raised the window and she took what would become one of the most popular novels of the 20th century and threw it into the alley and slammed the window and called her editor and said, I quit. I don't want to be a writer. It's too boring. It's not funny anymore. The book was supposed to be humorous. It's not. I, I was, you know, it doesn't seem funny to me. And I revised it so many times that I, I don't know what to say next, so I quit. And then her editor reminded her that she had signed a contract and received it in advance, and if she didn't deliver a finished manuscript, then she owed the publisher all the money she'd been living on for a year. And she'd spent the money. So she went back into the alley, and she picked up the ruined pages, and she came back in, and she retyped the novel again. And incidentally, it was not called To Kill a Mockingbird. The novel was called Atticus. It was called To Kill a Mockingbird later. Her idea was to call it Atticus. So thank heavens for word processing. You can move things around and save a day of labor. Check your information. Are all your facts accurate? Did you, are you misleading anywhere? Have you satisfied your reader's curiosity? If it's a formal paper with footnotes, have you cited everything appropriately? Um, I'm real big on showing evidence for things, maybe to a fault, I don't know. This book I just published on, on Vonnegut is about 280,000 words. It has 1,900 footnotes. Some chapters have over 300 footnotes in the chapter. One of my professors told me years ago, if it's controversial, footnote it. If it isn't strictly your own idea, footnote it. And I footnote everything. I never want to be accused of plagiarism. I never want to be accused of, well, that's what you say, Shu, you know, prove it. Man, I'll point to everything. In fact, one reviewer made fun of me because I probably went overboard here. But I footnoted a speech by Hamlet. <laughs> I just, I didn't want to get faulted on misquoting him. So I said, see, Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 3, Lines 56 to 83. And so the reviewer said, Shields, you know, footnoted Hamlet. Um, okay, fine, but you know what? No one's going to find that I didn't do my homework. Last check, your conclusion. The paragraphs should lead us right into the garage. You know, we should be tooling along, tooling along, and dead ahead is the driveway, and we pull up the drive, doors open, car comes into the garage, turn off the engine, we're there. Sometimes, very often, and conclusions are tough. It's, I guess one of the ironies of paper writing is that you think that getting the beginning right is the hardest part, and once you're launched, you'll be okay. Actually, conclusions sometimes are, are disappointments and leave a bad taste in the reader's mouth in that they feel like, that's it? Um, where's the rest of it? Or it, it doesn't follow, or it's suddenly trivial after Struggling to prove a point for a long period, we get to the conclusion, and you end on some silly note, some tongue-in-cheek thing, some witticism, thinking that you're leaving your reader with a piece of candy. No, your reader feels like they've been condescended to. After all this, the conclusion just says, so there, and you walk away. How do I get good at revising? Well, it's the same way you get good at golf, or playing the piano, or a video game. You do it often. You take revision seriously, and you set high standards. The more you produce, the more you can cut. That's why Vonnegut said, I just write whatever comes to begin with, and that gives me a lot of stuff. It's almost like offloading lumber. Whoops. It's almost like offloading lumber into your garage, and you're going to build something. You're not going to need all that lumber, but you're not either going to get halfway done in the project and realize, I'm, I'm out of walnut. I'm out of cherry. I got everything you need. Everything you need. The more time you imagine yourself as a reader looking at your paper, 
the easier it will be to spot problems. Pretend that you never saw this before, that your roommate, friend, mother, girlfriend, wannabe poet, wannabe writer handed this to you, and you're reading it for the first time. The more you demand of yourself in terms of clarity, the clearer your writing will be. Be ruthless. Be ruthless when it comes to being clear. Subordinate everything to the law of being, the principle of being understood. I would encourage everybody to take advantage of the Campus Writing Center. Um, it's got uh, wonderful handouts on a variety of things. Uh, so good, in fact, that I've, I've stolen some of them. Maybe I should footnote that. <laughs> I've stolen some of them and posted their handouts on the Great Lives blog because they've got so much good stuff there about writing and citations and bibliographies that for anybody who might be doing a paper as a result of coming to a Great Lives lecture, uh, I took stuff from the Writing Center with credit, giving credit where credit is due. It's a wonderful thing having a campus writing center. Uh, those of you who are a little older than the ladies in the back, like myself, will know that when you, if you were in college in the 60s and 70s, there were no writing centers. You know, you wrote, maybe you made an appointment to see your professor, and you took your chances. Uh, now, kids can go to a writing center and say, I'm lost. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. Or is this any good? What a resource. There's no reason to hand in a, a bad paper when you have expertise and, and, uh, and the, the tutoring available from people your own age. OK. Well, that's about revision. Um, any questions, things that you'd like to ask me about the writing process, getting from A to Z? Gwen. Well, I have a question just on the lines, because I, I used that same thing before about you know, if you have to take a breath while you're reading a sentence out loud and it's too long. Mm -hmm. And then I have these very you know, well-read and witty students oh, yes. who, who cite Faulkner and say, well, you know, exaggerated as they say, uh -huh. well, you know, what about his two and three page long sentences? You know, how, how do you respond to that? Well, um, the reason that they are exceptional, the reason that they're, they're in the canon of American literature, the reason that we look at them with a little bit of awe is because they break the rules and they are geniuses. Mm -hmm. And when you become a very proficient writer, you too can do things like that. Yeah, Hemingway is known for short, punchy sentences. It was a good bottle of beer. It was a good cold bottle of beer. It was a good cold bottle of dark beer, you know? But also, there's times when Hemingway lets it rip and keeps a long sentence totally under control, just like he's on a, a bike coming down a hill at 75 miles an hour, cool as a cucumber, and never seems to worry about hitting the pavement. So what you tell them is, is that these people are exceptional, they're models, they're something to aspire to. But right now, um, you're an athlete and you're training for the Olympics. Other questions? So how does that uh, connect into the creative license? Creative license? Um, you know, the, the only rule of creative license is, does it work? Does it work? I mean, if you can do something, and it has a powerful effect, or um, it just hits the right note, it's its own proof. It, it works, OK? I mean, think about this. Um, we're uh, accustomed to combustion engines that have pistons that go up and down. Do you remember the Wankel engine in the 1970s? The Wankel engine was a spherical chamber with a triangle inside that divided the chamber up into three empty spaces with a triangle in the middle. And the triangle spun and created combustion that way. It was a combustion engine. It was the most radical departure imaginable. But you know what? Opals, back in the 1970s, built in Europe, had Wankel engines. And they ran. They went 60 miles an hour. They made all the noises of a car. So, you know, all that matters in creative license is, does it work? And if it doesn't, then you're just, you're being a fuss budget. You know, come on, come on, it doesn't work. It's not effective. Get rid of it. Other questions? I was wondering, do you feel like you became an effective uh, 
Um, eventually, I got to the point where uh, instinct will tell me. It used to be that um, when I was a, a young writer, uh, I would sometimes turn in things that I thought were really good and be horrified to find out that everybody didn't universally think that it was brilliant. I remember when I was a freshman in college writing what I thought was a very high tone thoughtful, provocative uh, essay about Portrait of the Artist by James Joyce. And I got it back to my instructor, and at the very end he wrote, don't try to be so literary. And I thought, well, that, isn't that the point? I mean, aren't I trying to sound like an author here? And he meant, well, what he meant was it was overwritten, it was long-winded, I used big words when smaller words would have done, you know? But now I'm at the point where all that matters to me is does it move you? Is it persuasive? Will you turn the page? And I will drop anything that's not in service of those goals. So it was sometime, I started writing seriously when I was about 15, it was sometime in my 30s, when I began to realize that all that matters is, is it clear and persuasive? Isn't that about how long it takes to get good at anything? Whether it's, you know, playing the violin, being an actor? Any other questions? Okay, well thank you, you've been very attentive. We ended up a little bit early, but thanks so much. <laughs>